reckon that the um, YouTube is okay. Thank you. Good morning, members, officers. Welcome to the uh, Adult Social Care Select Committee. Um, my name is Roger Jackson. I'm chairman of the committee now. And uh, just to remind you that this meeting is being broadcast live and recorded for publication. Um, we've just got a few things to note. Um, at the appointment um, of full council on, on the 11th of May 23, that myself, Roger Jackson, as chairman, and David, Councillor David Martin, as vice chairman of the Adult Social Care and Public Health Select Committee for the 23 24 municipal year. To note the membership of the committee for 23 24 municipal year as follows Councillors Reginald there, Steve Carr, Dr John Doddy, Sybil Fielding, Paul Henshaw, Eric Kerry, Philip Owen, Mike Pringle, and Tom Smith. Thank you. We'll move on to item three. Ask the committee to approve the minutes of the last meeting. Take a show of hands, all those members who are present. Okay, I think for eating nanos who are there. Thank you. I'll sign those later. Kate, are there any apologies for absence, please? No, there are no apologies, thank you. Do any members or officers present have any disclosable or pecuniary interest to declare? No. And do any members or officers present present have any private interest, pecuniary or non pecuniary to declare? As is no. Okay. Well we move on to agenda item six, the first report on the on the agenda. Um, report on progress against 22, 23 strategic priorities. And I'd like to invite the independent chair of the NSAB, Scott uh, McKenzie, McKinney, is that how I pronounce it? I apologise that, Scott. Okay. Um, to induce the report, please. Okay. Uh, it's, it's uh, Scott McKenney, so I'm the independent chair yeah. yes, yes, of the Safe Garden Adults Board for Nottinghamshire. I uh, hope uh, members have had a chance to see the report in advance. Um, I was asked to come back and provide a six-month update for the presentation of the annual report in December. Um, it's just important just to remind uh, members of the statutory requirements of the Safeguard and Adult Board, which is to publish a strategic plan, which we have now in place, a 22 to 25 strategic plan, publish an annual report, which we'll do later in the year, and uh, conduct uh, safeguard and adults review under the CARE Act. Uh, and one of the main reasons that, that we have at the Adults Board under the CARE Act is to assure itself that local safeguarding arrangements are in place and are being <coughs> scrutinised as they should be. So that's the role of the board. To say that in item two in the paper, we speak about the strategic aims of the board are in prevention, quality assurance and engagement. And one of my roles is to ensure that the governance arrangements in place for that board are ensuring that prevention, assurance and engagement remain at the forefront of what we do around uh, safeguarding adults. So to provide some updates um, from the last six months, um, uh, one, of, one of the areas around governance is a uh, communication subgroup, both internal and external communication subgroup has been uh, revamped uh, to be more focused around how we do that communication both out into the communities around the work of the board and the partners in particular around the board um uh, which you know in the main, main three statute partners are police health and uh, adult social care um so we have a new chair in place for that and we're looking to develop a communication plan around how we engage well with our public. So any suggestions from, from this group in particular, because I know you want to be involved in some of the scrutiny uh, from any of your, your communities around how we do that would be very welcome. Um, the second item, item four in the paper, was a um, conversation took place in December at this board around um, refugees or asylum seekers being placed into um, Nottinghamshire as part of the, the national programme. So um, as part of the, as a chair of the board, uh, we took some work uh, on, on place to assure ourselves around the safeguard and adult procedures that they have in place uh, when people are both in temporary accommodation. Um, so they refer to that as either contingency or temporary accommodation, but also long-term 
accommodation, which is people who are integrated into communities long term. So Circo are the main provider for that. Um, uh, we have, what I've managed to establish as part of that work is they have a dedicated safeguarding team, uh, not for Nottinghamshire. So so a lot of the work that will be matured uh, as we work alongside them is is much wider because they're, they're obviously a national organisation. So the safeguarding manager will cover the whole of the northeast of England, for example. Um, but they have a dedicated safeguarding team, a risk and security team who are there to manage any information that comes out from any of the locations, both in terms of long-term um, uh, placement, but also the short-term or, or temporary, replacement, uh, temporary accommodation within the area. They provide training uh, to their staff on appointment, which is three-day induction training, which also includes an element of safeguarding as part of that. And then they also do mandatory annual refresher training to, to their staff. So in terms of the understanding of safeguarding, in particular around care and support needs that we look at from adult safeguarding under Section 42 of the Care Act, that, that is provided for. Um, they also, as part of the safeguarding team and risk and security team, they review all daily incidents reports that come out of any of the accommodation uh, to look for safeguarding concerns, any themes and trends that are of concerns for them. But they look at that as a much wider holistic approach in terms of risks, issues, and not just adult safeguarding under under the Care Act, you know, which is slightly different. So they have a much wider remit, um, which provided us with some assurance, we would have to say, around the intervention that they can provide either as safeguarding team providing advice to the location or onward referral and support to Migrant Help or other organisations or if it is a Section 42 into um, the adult MASH or multi-agency safeguarding hub. They also deliver... Uh, on-site health and well-being uh, inputs, uh, which circle then um, the commission a provider to do that, uh, which, and also we established that you know access to migrant help is a key part of what um, people who are either refugees or asylum seekers in this country get. Uh, they register with GP, and as part of any of the temporary accommodation in particular, they have on-site what they can refer to as housing officers who are there to provide that daily link and support with, with the, those individuals who are placed in the accommodation there alongside the supervisor. The One of the areas that probably we're working with them on, and I think uh, it's been a really positive uh, uh, way forward for CERCO around the way we've been working with them is looking at their data monitoring in particular. Uh, that needs probably to mature from their side um, to look at, because uh, I say they, they pick up holistic concerns, but actually how many relate to Nottinghamshire is one of the areas that we sought to find out, uh, and that's been mature. So they've, they've become much more data-driven. Uh, they've launched a new way of recording that and tracking, uh, trying to isolate uh, particular areas around their, their data, which is about number of service users they have at, at locations, categories of referrals, so what type of referrals, could it be mental health, could it be physical? Because I've got to remember a lot of the individuals who are placed into these locations have come from countries where they could have experienced uh, high, high amounts of trauma. Um, so they're looking to break down those areas and then look to track the outcomes. And that will be, you know, where, where do those referrals go to and what are the outcomes for referrals that they dealt with locally as it come into the MASH, what's the outcome. Um, so that so risk and security team, they share information uh, weekly with police as well around any information that, that's just of concern. And what, what the outcome is that, that we are looking as part of our uh, annual performance assurance tool is that um, Circle will present, provide that along with other partners into the Adult Safeguarding Board and procedures that then feed the annual rep report. Um, we've also had Circle came and presented to the last Safeguarding Adults Board, uh, which was last month, um, and we've asked them invited to come back in six months so we can then seek to continue to get that assurance around their processes, but in particular that bit they're looking at to become more data driven to understand how they're managing the safeguard. So it's been really focused on the safeguarding of adults. Um, myself and the, the board manager also attended one of the locations, spoke to some of the staff and uh, sought a little bit of assurance around what the setup was at the location, but also how the staff understood safeguarding. And so, so we're continuing to work with Circle around to ensure that they have a robust training offer in place to support staff. Um, but one of the key things is if staff have got any concerns, they can pick up the phone immediately to 
the, the safeguarding team and seek any advice and guidance. Um, and then that safeguarding team will then give them the advice and guidance or say do a referral and they can refer into our Adel Mash and likewise they can also have improved links with our Mash to receive uh, advice, and, advice and guidance around that as well. So that, that that's the main part of that bit of work that's ongoing. Probably areas to take forward, I would say, for, for Circle, but they're very engaged with us. And in the main, we probably received the assurance uh, that we were happy that they've got the processes in place to, to manage adult safeguarding at those temporary accommodations in particular. Uh, next item on the paper, um, this is about our voice and I, and I picked up earlier just about seeking some engagement with you as, as, as members around how how we, any advice and guidance that you've got, how, how we engage with adults with lived experience and also carers and families around how we take that work forward. Um, we've provided an example in the paper of how we're using um, an adult or a person with lived experience of homelessness to, to help us uh, deliver some of our training and you know complexity and safeguarding in the particular around uh, the, the difficult to engage training session that's part of that. So we're always looking to do that and in particular adult social care have got a really um, mature piece of work around our voice co-production with uh, lived experience so we that, that will be feeding into our quality assurance subgroup and learn and development subgroup is how, how we improve that engagement to ensure we're providing the right offer. Um, quality assurance, uh, one of the areas that we picked up on and we referred to at this committee in December, we're only just starting that work off, was around uh, the, the horrendous uh, show that was on BBC Panorama around Eden Field in, in Greater Manchester around the way that adults with learning disabilities were, were, were dealt with uh, as part of that sort of undercover investigation as it was, for, for want of a better expression. Um, so we've, we set up a task and finish group with the Integrated Care Board and uh, the Adults Board around uh, those close cultures and in particular looking at uh, how we can seek assurance that, that that would not happen in Nottingshire, which is all, all clearly a very difficult thing to do because close cultures by the very nature are, the, the, it's only the service users and the staff that, are, that they see what goes on behind those, those closed doors. Um, so we have got a presentation uh, coming to the executive and then the board this month around some of the recommendations around that. Um, that will be looking at some of the key areas around that. Uh, obviously, it needs approval by the executive and the board, but it's looking at you know an independent survey with uh, carers and, and families and service users, what that advocacy support is looking like for, for the service users. Um, links into host commissioners, so if somebody's from Nottinghamshire and is placed out of local authority area, how we, we ensure that we've got those safeguarding uh, uh, and advocacy um, monitoring processes in place. Um, and also close links with CQC. In fact, I've got a meeting with CQC tomorrow just to see how we can work together around, around that. So it's probably to give you some assurance that we, we are taking that forward. Um, whistleblowing is a big part of that because that's often the, the way in which we find out is, and it's how that we take that it's not an easy piece of work because this is something that's actually you know it's happened in a number of places over over a number of years but we want to do this properly make sure that we get the governance processes in place right so that we can prevent as far as possible this from from happening in nottinghamshire so that's been a really good and dedicated piece of work that's going on there jointly between icb and the adults board um so we've got a new chair for a quality assurance subgroup. Um, what well, one of the areas that we're looking around there is ensuring we we'll get all the data, the right data, and we get a lot of good adult social care data at the moment. Uh, but we also want to get some partnership data to help us feed that and and, and ensure that we're getting the whole picture around uh, so some of the priority areas on the uh, strategy, um, and that that information from from the partners will then feed. The annual report um, and the uh, individual scrutiny and audit, auditing that takes place and I believe you've all received the, the separate briefing paper that's been provided around that uh, to, uh, prior to today. One of the other pieces of uh, quality assurance work that's gone on, on, gone on the way is a regional assurance, so, so East Midlands regional assurance uh, review of the SAR, so the SAR Safeguarding Adults uh, Reviews Learning. Um, 
So that's going across uh, the five East Midlands regions, sponsored by the Association of Directors of Adult Social Services. Um, and that, so we, we are distilling that, the, the review back into the, the Safeguarding Adults Board. Uh, some of the positives that, that, that came out of that were, and it was one of the, the SARS, in particular K19, uh, was that the praise for the seven minute briefing approach we've taken, the practitioner reviews we've taken, um, how that then feeds into the biannual Safety and Adults Board learning, uh, uh, sorry, uh, events that we're learning, events we have, um, and then bespoke training that, that comes out of, of, of that. Some of the other work which, which I'll pick up as part of, of that review process is about ensuring that we have the right, uh, one of the areas was to make sure that we're absolutely crystal clear around what agency needs to take forward the learning, either system learning or changes that needs to place. So that's, that's one of the, so I'm saying it's distilling back into the process. I'll make sure that, that we're, we're picking that up as, as we take that forward. Um, So the governance structure, one of the, so the Adult Service Care commissioned a review last year of various aspects of how, how both of how the board functioned, but also how adult social care were functioning. So what, one of the areas that we're now going to implement uh, starting this month is an executive group meeting, which will sit above the Safeguard and Adults Board, and that's a executive group will form the, the police lead, the adult social care lead, and the ICB lead alongside the subgroup chairs and, and myself, just so we can really focus uh, that meeting on decision-making, progress against the strategic priorities, but also any risks and issues that need uh, discussed at that. So that, that's going to be implemented um, as of this month, and that will provide good uh, governance over the Safeguard and Adults Board. And, yeah, the last one is about collaboration and partnership working. So we have, we have published two Safeguard and Adults reviews, um, and action plans for those are now being implemented. Uh, two other safeguard audit reviews are currently underway. Uh, we're moving forward with them towards practitioner events uh, in, in the coming month or two to then look to then uh, move forward to publish them and the learning that comes out of them. Um, also, a new uh, sort of collaborative safeguard audit review has been jointly commissioned. Uh, we're just wait, waiting to appoint an offer and the terms of reference for that um, uh, safeguard and adult review, but it's going to be jointly commissioned with children's services to look at um, the learning both from a trauma-informed uh, side of things, from a children to adults approach, but also transitional safeguarding. And the final part of that, we have got a learning and development subgroup as part of the Safeguard and Adults Board. And um, you'll see at point 14 under collaboration is uh, two of the courses that are underway this, this quarter as part of the learn competency framework and learning pathway. Uh, so what happens is the information comes from Safeguard and Adults Reviews or the Quality Assurance Subgroup into the Learning Development Subgroup to then develop what the learning offer is. You've heard me talking about seven minute briefings and but two, two of the courses are how to identify and raise safeguarding concerns. So these are multi-agency training officers offers and also working with complexity and safeguarding and then um, that's what that's what I linked in earlier around that the the person with lived experience of homelessness is going to feed into to that training around difficulty to engage, and also uh, alongside that we're hosting two domestic abuse training sessions, uh, run by Equation, which is a locally commissioned partner, which so domestic abuse, coercive control, and behaviour in particular is one of our uh, priority areas for the board, um, and that's the board uh, update. Thank you. Thank you very much for that um, update, Scott. Um, I'm sure there's plenty of questions and debates, so that's the carry for the time. Yes. Um, I'll open it up to um, debate and questions. Councillor Kerry, please. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Scott, for your uh, report. <clears throat> there was one word I was looking for in the report that that you actually very briefly mentioned uh, towards the end of your resume, if you like, and that's about risk. This is all about risk and identifying risk, managing that risk. So you, you mentioned, do you have a risk register? Uh, is that developed or you have more work to develop? And how are you going to show us as, um, how through that risk register and, and the work you're doing to mitigate the risk, the progress you're making? Thank you. So we do have a risk. We didn't have a risk register. We, we now do have a risk register. Um, 
that a lot of the areas that are risks are picked up on the board development plan or, or improvement plan that we, we, we produce every year um, in line with the strategy. So any of the risks or issues or learning that comes out of any of the subgroups or you know, quality assurance audits or data, then that, that feeds into the business plan. So there is there is a flow through of that, that information and risks are at the top of everything that we do. Um, um, so any risks and in particular so you see from other social care, anything that comes in, you know, the front door, the mash, that's where the risks come into in terms of the, those referrals and care and support needs. So that's always number one of our priority. Sorry, just come back in, if I may, is, are, and are you able to share that information with us, or is that something that is a little bit outside of the scope of it? And um, I think um, so, so. There's a lot of information around risk. So I think um, Scott's referring to some of the high level risk, which I, I, I think we, we could share in the future if that's helpful. Uh, the more strategic pieces of work, but obviously within the department and all partners have really robust systems all the way from the teams up through into our senior leadership team and meetings with cabinet leads where we manage that more daily operational risk uh, through up into corporate. So I, th I think to sort of and to box that off a bit um, from from Sue's, the so each of the agencies, police or the three statutory agency, police, social care and health, will have their own risk registers. So our risk register will only capture something that's a, a joint risk that that's not adequately being managed between uh, by one of the statutory agencies. So so the risk register just now is is, is fairly light because of that. But um, as I say, we've got one and we can share if required. Pringle. Thanks, Chairman. Um, nice to see you at the helm uh, of this committee. Uh, I'm going to change the format of the 26 questions I've got. <laughs> Scott, um, NSAB on the website, we've not had any minutes printed since 2018. Why is that? I don't know. I need to check on that. I need to check one. Well, you obviously clearly not present. I need to understand why they're not. Uh, but I don't think there is a statutory requirement to to print the minutes of of those meetings. But I need I need to go away and check with colleagues nationally around that. Um, I don't think that's a question I can answer today. But I'll I'll take that action away to 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 know that. The bear in mind that the Safeguard and Adults Board is not a public facing board. Um, our statutory requirements are to publish an annual report. So that's our external facing, obviously coming to the scrutiny committee so i chair other partnerships and boards elsewhere and the minutes are not uh, published then either so i'd imagine that will be the answer that our statutory requirements are covered at the start is around publishing an annual report uh where's my notes sorry excuse me publishing an a strategic plan which we've done publishing an annual report and conducting safeguard models review that's our statutory requirements so that will be why the minutes are not published. So I've gone. I've, I've answered that question. I think. But yeah, thanks, mate. So I, I weren't asking about any of the other, but, but they stopped in two thousand eighteen, and I didn't know why. If you're just saying that it's not a requirement, you no longer re, re, uh, intend to do that, uh, then well, I can't come back on that. Okay, However, you. what I will come back on is what representation have we got on the board? Are, are you a member on the board now? Um, it's a conversation that, because uh, part of our development day that we had uh, in the spring was around representation of the board, so we have identified uh, some gaps, and I didn't put that in the report because it's part of the business plan, uh, some gaps in representation in the board, so academia, independent uh, lay members, uh, council members, so it's a conversation I need to have with uh, Council Barney and Council Carlton at some point around what, what the representation is at, but there's regular briefings to Council Barney and Council Carlton coming from the board in any case, but but whether that that's a question that, that I need to take forward with with, with the councillors to decide. Yeah, sorry, I, I'm not doubting that you and Councillor Barney discuss things. I'd expect that of, of, of Councillor Barney, to be honest. Um, but it's representation on the board, and if we're not producing minutes that are put, that you don't want to be seen in public, I'd expect to have some representation on the board, so that we we have a direct reflection of what's discussed at, at the board meeting. That that's what I'm asking to. Absolutely, very welcome. That as I say, I'm looking really to engage because you represent uh, our community, so it's, a, it's an important link. 
So I'll pick that up with you, Councillor Brown. Thank you. That's something we can probably look into. Uh, Councillor Henshaw. Uh, and thanks for your report, Scott. I hope you don't mind me calling you, Scott. Um, you know, I, th I think a theme that uh, actually per goes through this uh, report is uh, it's mentioned in quite a lot of the uh, bullet points and paragraphs is uh, training. Training is vital. When, when you look at your paragraph four and you mention it about asylum seekers and uh, refugees uh, and uh, the, the work that um, needs to be done around educating uh, not only the people that are working with them, uh, but also educating people in the wider community of Nottinghamshire that uh, are sometimes prone to um, be going off at tangents because of what people say about the about the issue. But as long as uh, we're, we're, we're um, affirming the fact that uh, the people that are working with the refugees are being trained up by Serco and the information is coming through, I think that's a vital thing. And the other the other point on training um, when you look at your points on quality assurance um, again uh, getting and getting training uh, because and you quite rightly identify the the uh, abuse that ended up or you know, was um, in place at Edenfield Hospital which is uh, um, harrowing to say the least to look at and read and, uh, and as you, everybody in this room knows that uh, that sort of abuse going off in these closed uh, environments is all too common and uh, the report on Edensfield is is a culmination or a, another addition to what happened at Winterbourne for you and other places and bearing in mind that the, the recommendations that were um, put out by uh, the investigating board on Wintermore view a lot of the recommendations still haven't been implemented so uh, it's vital that uh, we sort of break this sort of uh, closed culture uh, environment where people feel free to be able to discuss issues and you did mention um, uh, uh, whistleblowing now that's 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 all well and good, but I wouldn't like to think that that or it's a valuable tool. But uh, ultimately, a lot of people that work in these environments, uh, one, aren't aware of the, a whistleblowing policy. Two, they're actually frightened to actually whistleblow because of the consequence that they they sort of end up with by actually uh, doing the whistleblowing. So it's all around those sorts of issues. But um, uh, setting up this task and finish group, uh, I'd be... Uh, interested because it says that the uh, the recommendations will be coming in late late June. So obviously that's that sort of work is is ongoing and is nearly at fruition. So I'd be interested to see how how, how that report plays out and uh, works. Touching on the point that Councillor Pringle made made about uh, representation uh, on the board, uh, and uh, I understand it. I'm not 100 percent sure on the facts, but uh, I understand it that other county councils have uh, their chair of adult social care and public health or equivalent committee actually on on the uh, on the board so um, i know i know through you chair that uh, matt and and gets gets briefings but i think it would be vital if we could actually look at the governance and, and get him on as they do in uh, uh, as at gloucestershire leicestershire rutland do oh, actually uh, have the chair on um, anyway thanks thanks chair Thank you, Chair. I'll, I'll explore, you touch, started touching on it with regards to our safeguards and duties towards asylum seekers and refugees. Um, it has to be noted that as councillors and officers, all of us in this room take our safeguarding duties very, very seriously. Paragraph 4 of the report states that at the request of this committee, the board undertook assurance work regarding how the adult safeguarding needs of refugees and asylum seekers are met in Nottinghamshire. The, this council has a duty of care to these people and I think we exercise it very, very well. I have concerns though about the safeguarding needs of refugees and asylum seekers and the fact that the political language nowadays is, uh, is sort of muddying the waters. Um, I'm proud that this county offers a safe haven for asylum seekers and refugees in their time of need. Yet some MPs are deliberately encouraging residents to confuse asylum seekers and refugees with illegal immigrants. 
all we hear is stop the boats, etc., etc. Uh, and yet they still come. On the 4th of February, a number, in my view, of racists turned up at the Midland Hotel in Mansfield to bait asylum seekers. One, a big friend of the MP for Ashfield, someone who signed nomination papers for a candidate in the local elections in Ashfield. And others turned up with Union Jack masks on, ranting and raving at genuine asylum seekers being housed in the hotel. The same happened in Sandy Acre. And the language of their MP for Airwash was absolutely disgraceful. We have a bad enough job, a hard enough job <coughs> as, a, as a council to safeguard these very vulnerable people without some MPs stirring it up for political purposes. So I would ask them to stop with the language. Think about the duties that we've got as a council and the duties that their fellow party members on this council have got and take it very, very seriously. Councilor Clark, I've got a question. It's not a question. It's, it, well, it is in a way. It's basically yeah, it's... pointing out that we are being undermined by people who should know better in the language that they use and it makes your job even more difficult than it is already thank you thank you any members any other questions councilman dobby there we are uh, yeah, it, it, there was a, a mention somewhere along the line that the sub uh, groups uh, have been strengthened with mixtures of partners and new chairs appointed, etc. From my point of view, one of the biggest, newest developing uh, areas are in adults being diagnosed with various uh, elements of neurodiv neurodivergence around autism or testic spectrum disorder, Asperger's, etc. And it's known that they have a, a seven times greater risk of suicide than the general population. Yeah. Adult uh, uh, ADHD, etc. Huge levels of suicide risk and vulnerability uh, emerging amongst uh, diagnoses occurring. Many of them being done remotely by private clinics uh, all around the country uh, and then being created into the, uh, the, the current uh, melee in the subgroups you're talking about, where does the understanding and the linking with the people that would be closest associated with those, the autistic uh, uh, on autism support groups, etc., the crisis care groups, etc., where have all those been added in to give extra value to the, the safeguarding uh, role? Uh, so, okay, so I'm, I'm aware nationally around the, the statistics around, around that, around both adults and children, uh, and then increasing in, the, oh, there was a BBC panorama document about this, the same thing recently around uh, what was the probably wrongful diagnosis. Um, so we, mental health is part of how we monitor data, it's part of the quality assurance subgroup, um, so I'll go away and check that in specifically, but... Um, more often than not, you know, when you look at the duty of the Safeguard and Adults Board, it's focused on uh, the care and support needs and referrals and through Section 42 of the Care Act. So maybe we wouldn't wider pick up some of that unless there was a Safeguard and Adults Review or something linked to that or an audit that identified a particular issue. I know there was a big pinch point in health around that, um, nationally around um, demand outstripping resource. Um, I'm not sure if Sue wants to add anything further from an adult social care perspective around that. Um, yeah, I think it, it's a valid theme. It's come up in some of the learning from our SARS. It's, uh, and it, to answer your questions, it comes through things like the training groups. Um, so uh, we know that the majority of our, our top three referrals come from care providers and NHS providers and home care providers. Probably not surprising because that's where most of our support and care is, is delivered. Um, so we know, so there's a lot of our training and themes of the SARS focus on some things that are particularly important for that group around uh, understanding consent, best interests, dignity and care, 
that culture and leadership is really, really important for how we support that group. And there's then the specific modules of training uh, available around uh, learning, learning from about how to manage complex and challenging behaviours. So it's a theme that runs throughout. Hopefully that will give you a bit of a flavour of some of the ways it gets picked up. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Yeah, I'll go and double check that. We, we ha there's nothing that I've been aware of, made aware of um, as a chair around any person who has had a wrongful diagnosis that's then become a safeguarding concern or somebody who's on a waiting list, for example, or uh, who's, who's then become a safeguarding concern linked to neurodiversity. But um, I'll make sure we pick up if there's anything like that. Councillor Martin, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, my, my particular point is, is really orientated around asylum seekers and um, language barriers, because that's a real issue to, on how they interact with our services. And I think that's how much concentration do we place on emphasis that never mind them being diagnosed with all, all, all sorts of other stuff. Yeah, how do we, you know, because that's a particularly difficult issue. Um, <clears throat> you know, because they're interacting with our services and, and they're, you know, they're coming from all over, unfortunately, they're coming from all over the world. And I, and I think that, I, I know you've probably got a, a process in place, but I just want to understand how how robust that is for people coming from, say, I don't know, Somalia yeah, or wherever. Yeah, yeah I mean, the, the, all, all services, all statutory parliaments have access to a language like uh, as effective what it is, and um, so, so they can have a, an interpretation process which is there, which sits on side any conversation that takes place. And now with technology, that can it's a virtual on the phone type thing. So uh, that's something. I'm, I'm an ex uh, retired police officer, and that's you know, frontline police officers have access to that immediately as well when having to uh, engage with people. So so there are provisions in place for that. Uh, quite good provisions in place uh, that Circle have around that in particular. Thank you, Councillor Henshaw. Yeah, I've, 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 it's been interesting to listen to people talking about this, you know, particularly about the issue on, in Mansfield with regards to the Midland Hotel, because when you actually look into the facts of the issue, there was a lot of mistruths uh, spread around. And if you talk to the district council about uh, the, the point that uh, our, our own homeless people were uh, kicked out to put this, the refugees in, that, that's was totally not true uh, so you know it's very it's very important that we do get to the facts of the issue on these sorts of uh, issues because they are uh, you know they can cause a lot of uh, problem but coming back to the to the report um, and I did touch on it in perhaps it's, I didn't phrase it uh, uh, correctly in relation to a question I, I was I was more interested in the the uh, availability of of uh, training to improve services in in your closed cultures and i know that you said that there's a there's a uh, a, a report coming late june i'd be interested to presumably we will be uh, privy to or I'd be able to see that at some point because it's vitally important that we uh, you know we sort of uh, look at sort of because it's in our interest to break the, those sorts of cultures whether or not you're doing it through whistleblowing like i said or through through additional training but i'd be very interested to see that report and similarly when i mentioned about representation on the board i'm not sure whether it is in our or the council's gift to actually I presume it is to appoint somebody to the board and if, if matt and uh, um, Scott would be interested or put somebody to get actually participate in the actual board. I know they're having their interactions anyway, but I mean, I'd think that would be a good step if we could do that. Uh, you know, uh, just a couple of questions, Jay. Thanks. So I'll deal with representation first. That I'll engage with Councillor Barney around that, around who, who that should be. But yeah, I really welcome that. I chair all the partnerships and then we have representation from Council on that. So I really welcome that. It's a really good voice on 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 the board. Um, in relation to the report, um, yeah, that will be it will be part of our annual report when it's published. But um, and again, voice likewise, if who wants to to root in via Council Barney, I'm more than happy for anybody to come and and get a separate briefing alongside who, who the chair of that group is and the author of that report uh, to to provide that reassurance. But what what probably I'd like to reassure you all here is that. 
the work that we are doing with the ICB is to provide exactly what, you, what you're trying to get Council Henshaw is that a situation where as far as as, as we can, because you'll never always close off all risks to, to people who have, who don't have a voice of their own at times, is that um, is the assurance that, that that will, wherever possible, not happen in Nottinghamshire. Pringle. Uh, thanks, Chair, uh, and for letting me come back. And this this one's from what Sue said about the data and the amount of data. That's for Sue, so I'm not sure whether Councillor Barney or yourself wants to answer this. I'm not sure as it will come directly to you. But paragraph 9, which I've got open, I was reading, and the authority health safeguarding data is already scrutinised by the board. Um, but do we get to see that data at all? So the, the, we, we produce data as part of the annual report. Um, I was briefed today that you'd received a separate briefing report or with some of the data on it. So, so, so can, can we clarify that as to what's, what's been discussed at the board? Yeah, just to keep it uh, clear, that's what I'm asking. Thank you. Yeah, we'd, we'd be very happy to clarify um, and probably share as the, the report's in a wider setting as well. So you two be able to see the same data. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Bingle, thank you, Councillor Barney. Councillor Carr, who assures me, has a question this time. Yeah, oh, yes, it is a short one, this one. Um, given that what Councillor Doddy said is, as always, when Councillor Doddy speaks, that's absolutely spot on. Um, but obviously, you know, um, adults were once children and, and young adults. Um, how important do you think it is that um, these sorts of uh, um, illnesses, because that's what they are, are detected early, assessed in a timely fashion, and, uh, and, a, and a diagnosis is done in a timely fashion? Because, as I've said, these children and young adults will become adults and under the care of this committee and our offices over there. Oh yes, it is, it is important. Of course, it's important, um, and the organisations, or statutory partners, also have statutory duties uh, to meet around that as well. So, yeah, it's important. But um, the, when you look at the national data, um, the, the unfortunately coming out of the pandemic in particular, and I'm sure Councillor Doddy will be aware of this as well, um, is that um, the demand is is outstripping. Um, the the provision we've got to do that. Um, when I say we, the health have got to do that, and that's somewhere up. And I, and I do get, as I say, I chair children's partnerships as well, um, and I'm very acutely aware of of that. Um, so it's something that everybody needs to keep some some scrutiny upon, um, in particular around the the children's side of things and, and transition transitioning over into to adults. So. Thank you. I don't know if there's any other questions. I'd just like to ask, Scott, you've been working um, with people who live through the experience of adult social care, you know, been through the system. Um, is that helping you um, find uh, better ideas of um, safeguarding in the future and improve the efficiencies? Of yeah, we, we're always striving to do that. As I say, that adult social care have got their Our Voice programme uh, around trying to co-produce um, uh, what, we, what we can to ensure we provide the best service possible to those with care and support needs. Um, so, as I said at the start of my presentation, any ideas that come from, from members as well will be very welcomed around how we engage out there into the, in, into the communities um, um, because we know that we have got a, a, an ageing population um, who have, you know, self-isolation is one of our priorities. So how, how are we engaging and making sure that we're uh, have have those communities uh, wrapped around some of, of those uh, older people or those who have got care and support needs. So, um, yeah, so we're always looking to develop that where we can and then understanding, obviously, the demographics of our area as well. Uh, so that's, that's key part of work that's getting taken forward this year as part of the, the board agenda and also the ICB and health, uh, so social care. If there's no other questions... I'll thank you, Scott, very much for coming along this morning and uh, giving us this report and also answering the questions of, of members. It's been made very informative and um, I'm sure you'll probably come back in six months' time. I'm just going to ask Martin now just to go through the recommendations for 
yeah, hopefully I've got these down. If there's anything else you'd like to add, obviously just let me know at the end. So I've, I've got down four. Um, firstly, that the report we noted. Secondly, that the 2022-23 annual, annual report be presented at the December 2023 meeting of the Adult Social Care and Public Health Select Committee. Thirdly, um, that further information on the strategic risk management activity carried out by the NSAB be circulated to members of the committee. And finally, it's a little bit worthy this one, um, that the independent chair in consultation with partners gives further consideration to how um, NASAB partners are represented on the NASAB board. Does that meet with the approval of the members? All in favour? Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. We now move on to agenda item seven, uh, which is progress on the implementation of the discharge to access model and local authority plan for the national discharge grant. And I'd like to invite Councillor Barney, the cabinet member for adult social care and public health to introduce this report, please. Thank you, Chairman. I'm gonna hand straight over to Sue, who's going to introduce this report to the committee. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, so as a system, uh, we've been making steady progress implementing the discharge to assess model. It was originally put in within weeks as part of our COVID measures, our national COVID requirements. And our system then had a, a, a bit of a stock take with an independent peer review from the local government association, which resulted in an action plan with three key recommendations, priority actions, one of which was to implement transfer of care hubs, MDT teams in the hospitals. The second one was to have one agreed data, shared data set that we all signed up to, because we all had our individual ones and they said different things. And the third one was a culture shift, really. Um, I think during COVID we became uh, we were less co-located and some of the joint working um, uh, that we put in place was lost a little, but also to be strength-based in our decisions and to focus on what, what the outcomes are for people, not just the, the times of, of them uh, going home from hospital, although that is obviously important. So the discharge to assess model, um, it's had it's got really positive benefits for people because it's got a focus on people going home first back to their own homes wherever possible um, and it's got a focus on enabling people back to maximum independence and and rehab to make sure if people need that in a in an accommodation based setting they can get they can maximize their health and well-being um, it does require more resources for, for social care um, because we are working both in the hospital on what decision that person needs, what support they need to go home for a few days. Um, and then we're following it up and completing that assessment uh, once the person settled back at home. And that's a really positive thing to do. Um, previously, our teams did all that in the hospital. It's a much better way of working because people um, feel much better usually once they're back at home and that means that no long-term decisions are being made about what care and support and maybe if they're thinking about a move into residential care that's not done at a time of, of crisis so um, so our performance has steadily improved um, we, we, we also had a uh, following been in a, in a couple of critical incidents post January. We also had an NHS England assurance plan that built on our, our, our earlier plans and our performance has been getting better steadily and we can see that we have, we have got more people going home. It is taking, uh, it's taking less time. We can show the data at the moment in the graph um, about how that's taking less time for people that are referred through to social care. And we are also seeing the use of interim residential votes decrease. So that means maybe the, the person could have gone home, but we didn't have reablement or that community-based support available for them. So that we, in, in times of high pressure, we will put people into temporary residential care, which is an outcome that we, 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 don't, we don't want for people. So it's positive that we've seen that really reduce. So success around um, delivering this, it does rely on complex interrelationships between all the multiple partners. 
and the one agreed data set that I mentioned, that's really helping because we all agree on what it says and that it's accurate. It's really starting to show where some of the, the actions need to happen. And it's also showing where we can simplify processes that might have got a bit overcomplicated between us. So um, that's a, an ongoing process as we get more and more of that data set in place. So um, we've also got, uh, I've got set out the joint health and social care plan, which is how we have together agreed how we'd use the discharge fund. And this was approved at the May's Health and Wellbeing Board. And the plan focuses resources on the areas needing further investment that we identified from the peer review and our national assurance plan. Um, for example, we've put significant additional capacity in the hubs and, and into our assessment functions and additional reablement capacity. And importantly, that's not just across our three acutes, it's also in our specialist mental health hospitals as well. So we're also learning in use of the grant in terms of what we've done with the Winter Fund um, and the contribution that our voluntary sector services can make to supporting people at home, as well as investing in a, in a piece of work to assess uh, what will most support our independent sector providers to recruit and retain, retain staff. And that will inform our integrated care system, workforce strategy and plan. Really important for social care because the majority of our staff are in that sector providing care. Um, people tell us that they um, want integrated streamlined services, that they don't want to be falling between the gaps. So we've also invent, invested in some services to support uh, more integrated ways of working across our social care reablement and community health team and also something we've wanted to do for a long time which is to develop an integrated therapy training program um, so there's a lots of lots of positive pieces of work in in the plan and uh, i'm happy to take any questions thank you sue council barney if you have anything to add okay okay back to work. questions council Fielding. Thank you very much. Welcome, welcome a report that encourages people to be out of hospital as soon as that they possibly can and into an appropriate environment that will aid their uh, recovery. Uh, your graph at 10, um, it's very difficult to know what is mid-south mid or, the, or, the, or the overall with it all being in lovely grey. Uh, the other thing that I would note is, is it doesn't include uh, North Knots, which, as I say, is a, a, an issue. And, and the other thing uh, assurances I would, 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 would want is that I'm absolutely aware, that, particularly for Bassett Law, that uh, you could end up in hospital that would be over county boundaries. Certainly for acute, you'd be in Sheffield, and certainly where my parents uh, lived, uh, they... My father had been in Scunthorpe and and uh, and been discharged from Scunthorpe back into in, in community. Certainly, that had its, uh, its challenges, and I sincerely hope that we've uh, improved on those sorts of issues. But certainly, you could you could end up in Sheffield, Doncaster, Scunthorpe, or Lincoln, and it's 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 ensuring that these processes work equally as well uh, across county boundaries, uh, depending where where our residents live. Yes, thank you. It's a good point. The reason the uh, North Knots data isn't on it is they have been a little bit behind uh, with the data. So they've got, they're, they're fully signed up to it. It's just that we're, obviously we're doing it in phases. So that data will be available soon and we'll be able to see, see similar. Um, and, and absolutely, I, I totally agree with you that people, people don't want to have to travel, their families support when they're in hospital is really important. Um, and I know that you know all systems are looking at how we can um, make sure that the services are as local as possible. Um, and obviously during during COVID and even during recovery that was a challenge. Um, and we're now balancing obviously the you know the amount of time people have to wait as well for it's not just the urgent care, it's the elective surgery. So so that is um things that all systems partners are, are grappling with. Councillor Carr. Uh, thank you. Uh, just like to say how pleased I am to see a whole report on this issue without the words bed blocking being used because I think it's such an offensive um, thing to do so thank you for that um, 
just really, I, I'm not really confused, but just want it confirming. Um, I'm reading about all the, the, the money that's going to be used, which is fantastic. And I turn to the yellow appendix A and it still says fund bid. Have we actually secured this funding or is it a, still at a bid stage? Just to clear my confusion up. Yes, it has been confirmed and approved. The funding is a national allocation. They've confirmed the actual financial uh, envelope for this year and are committed to it next year, but we haven't got a financial envelope. And thank you for noticing that we do, didn't use language like that in the report. It's part of our uh, trying to be more people-centred and uh, strength-based in the language and culture that we use. Thank you. Thanks, Chair, for bringing me in. Uh, yeah, I'm interested in this report um, for a number of, number of reasons. Um, obviously, we I think everybody in this chamber would say uh, once somebody's in hospital, then uh, th there may be a better road to recovery in their own home with their own support networks if they've got them and uh, quicker some people can get out of uh, hospital, the better. Uh, it, but uh, looking at the report, uh, I'm, when when a per, say a person comes to having one of these two daily uh, re reviews when they're in hospital, how many um, social care staff have we in um, hospitals? Uh, do we have one in each uh, hospital, or do we have uh, uh, our staff? roaming being peripatetic and moving around from hospital to hospital so that they can actually uh, be in on the discharge meeting uh, from personal experience um, i've been involved in um, discharges uh, of particularly people who have a learning disability and uh, sometimes the uh, the meeting is in is in a, a vein that pressure is put upon people to uh, take the person back and sometimes that could lead to an unsafe discharge uh, and uh, I'm hoping that this this new way of uh, looking at things would eliminate um, unsafe discharge and I wondered if that was um, something that um, uh, our staff would, would be looking towards. Um, what I'm worried about is the, the bullet point on uh, the criteria to reside in a hospital bed. Um, I mean, on, on, on the simple face of it, you know, it means somebody's presumably recovering or, and, and don't actually need to be in hospital. So what criteria don't, don't they actually meet? I mean, somebody could not meet the criteria to reside in, in, a, in a hospital bed, but then uh, be put up people could be put under pressure to accepting them back at home when the support networks and everything aren't in place. So I'd be interested to, um, uh, I, I might be in the report and I've missed it, uh, you know, look at the criteria to reside. But I'm, I'm, I'm interested in uh, how our social care staff are involved and how they are actually um, 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 integrated into the decision to get get somebody uh, from hospital to home and the other thing in relation to the money was been touched upon looking at the uh, the nearly two million pound uh, in the on page 20 pro providing 50 uh, supervision for 50 uh, additional people presumably with uh, mental health and mental health issues and uh, 50 young people so presumably that means that there are 100 people going to benefit from that two million Pound spending or or not, but it seems a lot. I won't say a lot of money, but I know services tend to cost cost quite a bit. But two million pound for what I think is hundred people, maybe, uh, or perhaps it's not. Thank you. So um, it's a great question. How are our staff involved, um, and how are they integrated in the decision? So we've got um, we've now got staff again because our staff had to leave hospital during COVID. So uh, getting staff back and co-located with their colleagues is really important. We've got staff in all the hospitals, um, including staff Saturdays at the moment, and we are looking at what we, what we need as a system for Sunday. 
Um, so um, they have uh, the transfer of care hub. It's basically a multidisciplinary team meeting that will make that decision and our staff are involved in, in all of those. So if people go home and they don't need any support, we're, we're, not, we're not involved. But if they need support, there'll be that MDT meeting and they will, will make a decision. Um, and it's, it says there's sort of four routes out of hospital or three if they need support and that's set out at paragraph three they make a decision and they'll, they'll arrange those those services for the person to go home um, so fully involved but obviously the majority of our staff are now in the community because once the person's been home for a couple of days they'll go and, and visit see how they've settled see if they need any further rehab um, or if they need an if they indeed they need an assessment for any ongoing support um, and um, in terms of some of the, the, other, the other issues we're bringing up, so um, we are also, it's not in the report, but we're also doing a review of what's called pathway to the rehab. So if somebody can't be supported at home with reablement and they need accommodation-based rehab, and we, we're looking at all of that. And I think some of your questions uh, were around, you know, how we're dealing with more complex needs. Um, if a person doesn't meet the criteria to reside in hospital, that means there's, there's no reason, there's no medical reason, whatever support they need for their health, that could be met elsewhere. And obviously nobody wants to stay in hospital longer than they need to. Um, so getting that um, accommodation base, that sort of step down, if you like, or intermediate care, this is how it's been uh, spoken about in the past getting that right is something that we're working to towards winter so if people um, aren't ready to quite to go home or back to wherever they were living but they need a bit of something else that we've got that that right and it has purpose that they're getting something that's helping make them them better the other the other bit that's really really key in all this is early planning and that's something that is quite challenging particularly with the sort of you know turnover at times of pressure of, of the numbers of people that the health system's working with but that early planning is really key and that's something that we're looking at in all in all the hospitals and um, also learning so they're starting to um uh, the, those, those transfer of care hubs, if something doesn't go well, then they're look, looking to learn from that and build that into their plans as well. As you say, sometimes we are still seeing discharges, people home with not quite everything that they, that they need. So, um, so hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Councillor Gary. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, just following on from that, so <clears throat> obviously this is a grant, it's for next year, and you've allocated where you think the key uh, places for improvement and spending are. What's the process for feeding back the results of the work you're doing using that grant to government or the funding, whatever, for, for obviously future improvement? Fortnightly reporting to government um, against um, how it's helping to re reduce uh, the numbers of people, uh, well, increase the number of people discharged and reduce the amount of time that they spend in hospital. Thank you, uh, Sue. Uh, Councillor Doddy. Uh, yes, thanks. Um, it's a lovely paper. I think it reads really, really nicely. Uh, uh, it's really detailed. Uh, it, it's sort of like the, the holy grail that we've been after for many, 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 many years, nicely explained um, in, in terms of the, the whole ethos of the integrated care service will be to show this level of integration across uh, the hospitals and social care and out into the community and a seamless transfer through the system uh, uh, that ran beautifully and smoothly. And uh, I think we can all see it in our eyes, mind, uh, on our mind's eyes, but in actual reality, seeing it is a, is a much, much, much greater uh, um, challenge. It, it was interesting that you do get your own safe discharges for 24, 48 hours later, people are bounced back into hospital again, largely because of clinical deterioration uh, in a condition uh, rather than anything else. But hospitals have always been judged on that. That's always been part of their criteria for assessment, how, how, how they're actually doing that. And I remember uh, when I was uh, up at Sherwood Forest Hospitals, uh, Kings Mill, a little while ago, and they had a system called red days and green days. So everybody had a chart at the bottom of their bed and you would have a stamp on it, which was a green day. 
which was a day that you needed to be in hospital for the service to be provided for you in that hospital. But a red day was a day that nothing positive was being done within the hospital that was improving your care. Now, that didn't mean that you still didn't need to be there because you might have been waiting for a scan or you might have been waiting for an intervention, you might have been waiting for a second opinion from another consultant who hadn't came. But it was the same idea of criteria to reside but it wasn't an all or none criteria uh, and often being in hospital is not an all or none criteria that there may be nothing productive happening for you on that day so there's no reason for you to be there but you still need to be there because there are other things in the pipeline going forward i mean it will be great if we get this running and it helps out this winter so we don't have the, the care hotels that emerged around the country uh, and that we don't have um, uh, the, the need to take over care homes etc on a, on a short-term basis etc so it's a, it's, a, it's a nice idea the workforce is challenging and when i look at the workforce side of things i say do i see anything in this report that's technologically in an advancement that's actually going to reduce the manpower required such as uh, uh, monitoring systems in people's houses to look at their activity levels when they're discharged home, remotely monitored, so as one person can look after 5, 10, 15, like the uh, remote uh, wards that have been set up uh, through uh, Kingsmill Hospital where they remotely monitor people from areas. So this is almost like it's, it's, it's crying out for somebody to say, how can we look after more of these people at home with the same workforce? And I, I was looking for technology, I was looking for some advancement in monitoring. Um, somebody was saying recently they had a, a monitoring where a person's movement was picked up and they looked at the fact that they went five or six times to the toilet instead of once figured that hey hang on a minute they might have a water infection before they deteriorate get admitted to hospital we could get somebody out there to see them and therefore this is a technology which is sort of spreading around where are we so in terms of our uh, advancement in that line bearing in mind the rest of it but i i, I, I do love the concept of it Yeah, it's, a, it's another really good another really good question. Um, so I would say we are we are using a good range of tech, but there's a lot lot more we, there's a lot more we can do. And of course, the tech changes all the time. The tech changes rapidly. So um, uh, you mentioned virtual walls that are, that are using that technology. We've we've for a long time in social care used similar things in people's houses who might be at risk of uh, if they are experiencing symptoms of dementia and they might leave the house and people are worried they don't know quite how much they're leaving the house so it can remotely monitor them of course all the smart technology is now taking that into a much better place so we're starting to use um, that as well the the hubs the transfer of care hubs can put um, technology in and um, it's 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 just social care the transfer of care hubs in the hospital they're the they're the multidisciplinary team who are, um, who make that initial decision of what the person goes home with for a few days um, and uh, we really hope that that will e extend to health because it's been our social care staff who mainly do that um, we also our our council's reablement service is part of our maximizing independence service so we we'll always look so a lot of people will go home with that service and then they will be looking at what text they might put on put in place along with um, any therapy um, assessment for equipment all with the aim of making the person be as independent as possible um, and as we work more closely with community health colleagues then we're, we're, that's one of the things that we hope to be sharing um, and we've also used tech for example in um, one of our one of our independent sector home care providers has been uh, piloting doing some visits by remote calls. So just maybe sometimes doing a call, if it's just a prompt with a medication, for example, or something, it doesn't mean that they wouldn't go out, but they're just testing that now. And that's been quite successful um, so far. So, so um, uh, it's an area I really love. Um, and I think we've got some really good examples, but I think we could um, do more and more at scale and more across our partnerships as well. How many houses out there do you think hospitals and social care have?
have actually got smart technology in them and, and who monitors it and who pays for it. So currently the main monitoring is through um, um, the main the, the main monitoring is through the district councils and their community alarm systems and uh, social care build on to that if we can so if we put in close assistive technology and there's a whole there's a whole range of devices that that we can we can build into those or if if we if we identify someone then they'll put in that that platform we'll work the district councils they'll put in um, the basic um, platform to enable us to do that I, I couldn't i can't honestly i'd have to look at the figures but it's in the thousands that we already support with technology um, but it's got such a, a, a diverse range now as well um, so it is something that we're, that we're using i think the potential is great for them and it's, it's it's as everything it's planning it getting it in place quickly in that hospital environment and that's one of the things that we're working on how can we get that wide range and is any of this grant allocated to doing that? Well, um, we've got, there's no specific element of grant, but we have put in, um, so you'll see in the voluntary sector, um, we've included that, that one of the things we want to look at is how the voluntary sector can help people put tech in. Um, so might get the person home and then rapidly get that in place. So that's something that we want to explore. And then you'll see um, we've got um, mentioned strength base. And what we mean by strength base is it's doing things that um, focuses on what people can do and helps them be independent. So in terms of the extra staffing that we've got in that first block, we've got a few staff who are going to help them, who are going to work in the MDTs and really make sure that they're using things that we can do like tech, and that we have much more therapy-led uh, work happening. So if, if somebody can use technology equipment or have a, a short-term input, um, to get them back on their feet, then um, that's what we'll be going for. But I think the, that's something that we need to work much more on as a system. Sometimes um, health professionals can be a bit more risk averse um, than social care colleagues. So it's one of our system culture changes that we're working on. We've got a bit of a resource in this plan to do that. Thank you, Sue. Yes, thank you, Sue. I actually do think modern technology has a great future in this day. I was fortunate enough to go around Portland Training College a few months ago and to see that the modern technology is used there with the disabled people, which I'm sure can be transferred into this as well. It's very exciting. It allows them to live on their own and aid as well. So, yeah. Councillor Pringle. Chairman, um, really love the paper because it offers everything that I want to see happening. Um, but in it, to scrutinise, if I go back to the the chart, the, the grey chart, um, and I don't want to be negative, but we're still worse in the last 18 months on discharges than we were the previous 18 months. So it'd be good to see that change at the, at the next opportunity that we can. Um, and again, funding, Matt, it's not enough. You know, it's not. It's a great start, but it's not enough. We need to lobby for more. Um, and it's difficult to to scrutinise a paper which is so new coming back will come back with results um, and, it, and it's difficult for me to separate the needs of those out there whether they be physical needs um, but I am really keen on seeing responses to the mental health side of things um, so we'd really like to see a detailed report come back after a time that you and Councillor Barney and Edison come back to us so we can actually scrutinise uh, and be able to see where we are with that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I don't know if you want to add. Sorry. sorry, Chair. I'm sorry. Um, and you're quite right. We've not mentioned bed blocking, but we've mentioned MFFD. So if you don't know what FMFD is, it is. There you go. <laughs> it's basically when a person's well enough to go home. And uh, yes, we can certainly um, we can certainly make sure that when we bring a report back, there's a specific the the, the progress with mental health will be in that. And just to pick up on the on the question made earlier about the two million pounds and the two workers, the t the cost of the two workers um, is about uh, seventy nine thousand. The two million is a wider heading for a wider set of initiatives that were funded. Thank you, Councillor Smith. 
Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, Sue, just a quick one following on from your answer that you gave to Council Henshaw um, a, a couple of questions ago. Um, you said that we've we've got staff in hospitals on Saturday, so that takes us to six out of seven days uh, a week, and we are working out the process of staff on Sunday. How long do you expect um, it, it will be until we have a plan for what, what we're doing with our staff on Sundays? Yeah, so, um, so we did use South staff in the hospitals on Sunday, but the other parts of the system weren't working. So, uh, so we had to move our staff to the days when we got the work. So the aim is to have, um, by September, that plan for what we need. There's no point having one partner there if we can't get clinical decisions, uh, pharmacist shirt, and you can't get transport, for example. So um, that's something that we're developing for September with the aim of getting that in place uh, by the end of the year. Thank you. Councillor Carr. Yeah, um, so you, you mentioned that the, uh, the technology is at the moment linked to what the districts and boroughs provide in uh, what we call in Broxdale Lifeline, but there's a charge for that, to have Lifeline in Broxdale. I don't know what it's like in the other districts and boroughs, and I just wondered, do the NHS take up the cost of that when installing that sort of technology? Um, not at the moment, and the NHS it, don't actually install that technology at the moment. This is one of the things that as we as we develop our integrated offer that we'll we need to work on together. But um, as I mentioned, smart technology. A lot of people have smart technology that can now be used for things with some of the old equipment that we use. We can we can do things with with, the, with things that people would already have in their homes. Thank you. I don't think any further questions. Oh. Um, look, I'm touching on the point earlier, I've looked, looked at the uh, yellow appendices uh, in relation to staffing levels and, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, things laid out um, possibly will, if, if it comes to fruition, would be fantastic. And my my concern, well, not concern, my worry is that, uh, you know, there's a and we all know there's a, a, a crisis in social care in relation to recruitment and retention. I just wonder how, um, how um, recruitment will go on for these uh, these positions and whether or not you think that uh, uh, we'll, we'll have any difficulty or not in, in recruiting for the positions and uh, just hopefully that people will offer themselves to work in the, these sorts of uh, roles. But, uh, you know, that's just a concern I've got that... Um, we may not be able to recruit uh, sufficiently to uh, be able to put the plan in, into fruition. Um, yes, I agree. It is one of our biggest challenges. So I'll start to answer this question. And then one of my team, Emma behind me, who's been working hard on this, can maybe come in with a bit of, an, of a more detailed, concrete example. So, um, so as we've been developing the plan, we've been getting ready to recruit. Um, so that's one of the things. And we've tried many different things. Um, and we're working with our corporate HR team as well. So things like enabling like people being able to apply using CVs rather than our, our lengthy form um, and things like that. And, uh, and doing recruitments in local communities, local, more place-based. Um, and... Uh, certainly for, for more frontline staff, um, having a more value-based recruitment. So starting by asking people questions about their attitude and what their approach is, um, because the, the frontline jobs are all things that we can train people with the skills uh, if people have got that right attitude. So, um, and, and of course, there's a handful of uh, some of this work we already had funded in the winter fund. So um, we've got new plans, different ways of recruiting in hand, um, but it, it will remain a challenge, but we'll do our best. I'm, I'm, if Emma maybe might be able to give a bit of an example. Sorry, thank you, I need some technical assistance. Um, my name is Emma Shand, I work in Ageing Well Services along with Sue, and I've been working on the Discharge Fund. Um, we have a recruitment campaign and workforce plan in place that, that starts today for the 26 community care officers that we would like to recruit for this work, and there are registered staff. So there are staff that are wanting to work directly with people 
um, some hospital facing but majority community facing for physical health, mental health and also for older adults and how we support them to get them home and, and maintain them at home. Um, in terms of swift discharge but also in terms of bulking up our community resource so we can hopefully avoid some of those admissions into hospital um, okay. as well. So in terms of from both front and back end of, of the hospital. The recruitment campaign starts today. We are doing it differently, as Sue says. We're looking more about strengths and values in terms of why people want to come into the work and why it's such a valuable role to do. And then offering that training um, in terms of what's required when people join us. We're looking at different ways of doing that in terms of use of CVs, um, less bureaucratic recruitment processes, and still with robust um, in terms of robust enough in terms of making sure people have got um, the right attitudes with the right training, but also in terms of um, in terms of criminal records bureau checks and things like that so people are safe but actually making sure that we're getting people with with values and attitudes that we can then shape and um, we're also going out differently so we are using great use of social media um, LinkedIn indeed and those sorts of ways of actually um, recruiting people in so as I say the first tranche that starts today and we'll learn as we go along from that we did also just um, have a, a smaller recruitment campaign in the winter when we had the winter pressures fund came in and we needed to step in people very quickly we did that in some recruitment days so we invited people in to come in to have a conversation about the role have the interview or conversation then and we actually that was a very successful way of getting people into those roles and all of those people are now secured permanent jobs with the council through that initial temporary recruitment phase in january so thank you any other questions or comments regarding that Okay. Thank you. No, no, thank, thanks for that, because obviously looking at the report, and you, you touched on it, and, and, and we're all very concerned about the um, the um, discharge of people that possibly could have mental health issues and uh, making sure that they're discharged appropriately into, an, into a safe environment or a more supportive environment, because, uh, you know, obviously mental health and, and those sorts of issues we, we take very seriously. But it's good to note that the... Um, uh, the the people that are recruited will have the in depth training because obviously you, you you're talking about uh, uh, people that are younger people that will be discharged right up to the elderly people with mental health issues and people with a learning disability uh, as well so uh, the skill mix for the uh, for the people that we recruit um, really does need uh, enhancing with training thanks Jim thank you. I was going to thank uh, Councillor Barnes for coming and presenting the report, but he stealthily um, sidestepped it to Sue and Emma. But well done. Thank you, officers, for those questions. I mean, uh, I think this paper has been greatly received by members, and I think what it's achieving, uh, you no know, access to discharge, it, it, it is great news. Because it's, I, I personally feel, you know, people who have managed to get in their own homes can convalesce a lot better, a lot happier because they're with familiar surroundings. But it's also important that they do have access to the right equipment that they may need to help them also to people to visit them as well. So like Paul said today, you know, if we're not careful to go back in the hospital. But I, I think we are definitely going on the right tracks with that. And I do totally agree that I think people are so much happier at home uh, if possibly can. But we need to be there just to support them to keep them there if we possibly can. Anyway, thank you very much on that. Okay, Martin, do you want to read out the recommendations, please? Just, just three. One's quite specific. Um, first one that the report be noted. Um, the second, the further progress report on the activities around the discharge to assess program be brought to a future meeting of the committee at a date to be agreed by the chair and vice chair. Um, I've not whether this one quite it right, but um, the graph of paragraph ten. Would it be possible to have that resent round to committee members when the North Knots information is available? Yeah, fantastic. So that, they're the three recommendations. Okay. Does that meet members' approval? Is it seconded? Yeah. Second. All those in favour? Thank you. That's unanimous. We now move on to agenda item eight, um, the establishment of a task and finished working group on the day opportunities strategy. Uh, I think Martin, you're going to yeah. take this one. Yeah, just briefly, obviously we had the report about the um, day opportunity, opportunity strategy implementation at the committee meeting back in March, and there's quite a few areas of interest that were flagged up during that discussion that members decided they said they'd want to look at in more detail. Um, so subsequent discussions with the chair, vice chair and officers um, agreed that the best way to look at that would be a task and finish group. Um, so it can be looked at in, in more detail. Um, so what we're looking for your um, approval now is just that with that group is set up and that the chair 
and vice chair works with the officers to um, get the scope um, drawn up. Um, once the scope has been drawn up, we'll get that sent round to committee members, um, just so you know what the reviews looking about in detail and then um, we'll be asking for volunteers um, to take part in the group as always if you aren't able to take part yourself you can no nominate someone from your political group to take your place if that's what you'd like um, but we'll be um, sending the scope around as soon as it's been um, agreed thank you martin does that meet with members agreement any questions paul yeah, no, I have no problem with setting up a, a task and finish group. You know, if we've got a certain set of criteria for looking at, uh, uh, you know, the um, the the, the uh, document that came out in relation to the future provision of uh, um, day services, uh, I, I, I I'd just sort of set things out right from the beginning. I mean, I'd I'd more than willing, uh, happy to participate in the group, but right from the onset, I, I don't want uh, the group to be. A, 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 be a smokescreen for uh, cutting back services. I'd, I'd rather the group uh, and the task of well is to be determined by the group, obviously, that it uh, be a means of it enhancing and improving services rather than reducing them. Thanks, Chair. Councillor Carl. Um, will there be proportionality of the groups on, on this, or is it people who just want to? <laughs> It because obviously this committee is a politically balanced committee. If if an MP then go and screw it, it should roughly be politically balanced. And that's why I say if, if you can't take part yourself, you can nominate someone from your your group to take place. So it should it, it, it should be roughly balanced. Okay, I move the recommendations as on the report. I'll second that. Second. All those in favour of that? Thank you very much, members. And move on to the work program. Uh, I think Martin's going to say a few words on this. It's quite an in-depth and heavy work program. Yep. So I think yes, yeah. we'll looking at that. There we go. Thank you very much. Um, so this is obviously the, the final committee meeting um, that's detailed on the work program. So um, we will be carrying work out over the next um, few weeks with the chair and vice chair and officers, and, and then in, in turn with yourself about what the work program should be looking like um, for the next meeting and then that work program will be presented to the overview committee in September um, for, for the approval but um, really it's just noting just to say that there will be lots of activity going on about what it actually looks like um, for next year. Members happy to know that? Councillor Cough. I don't know whether it needs to go on the work program or not or whether it needs to be looked at separately by public health officers but I had a bit of a, a, an experience when I went for a COVID booster. Um, the NHS website is quite clear. It says that if you suffer from asthma and you have to periodically take steroids to, get, to put it mildly, get stuff out of your lungs, then you are entitled to the spring COVID booster. But when I got to the actual vaccination place, I got turned away because it wasn't on my list. And I am I, I, aware that there are many people in the same situation as me that did not receive a COVID booster this spring. Thank you. If there's no more questions, I thank members. Oh, Councillor Pringle, sorry. Yeah, sorry, Chair, just uh, on the work programme, uh, 13th of March 2023, the uh, day opportunity. So, so will the Working Committee be actively engaged with this as well, as, as, part, of the, uh, as part of the review? That, that's where it, that's where it comes from, because um, because they were just air, at the meeting in March. We flagged up areas of further interest, and it was agreed that the task and finish group would be the best way to look at them rather than bringing it back to the committee. But there's still the the resolution there that a further report can come back to committee as a future time at the agreement of the chair. So we're still on the on what page is this? On the work. Oh, let me get that. Is it on page forty four where it says? Um, 
can I just uh, just so just for clarity, Councillor Pringle? So the day opportunity strategy update that came to committee in March, one of the the actions that fell out of that was to set up the task and finish group. Um, we need to agree the scope. Uh, with the chair and vice chair, uh, but yes, that will be uh, myself uh, and po possibly Bridget um, in terms of the wider day opportunity strategy program. Um, so yeah, that's the the ongoing work that uh, fell out of the March update. Councillor Kerr, I think once we've got the scope up, we'll come back to members of this committee. Yeah, Councillor Kerr. I think it's quite clear that, that page thirty eight is the old one. That develop that, that that part of the work plan. If you go to page 49, where I, there you've got for a project start date to be confirmed is day opportunity strategy. And it states again what we just talked about. Thank you. Anyway, thank you members. Thank you attendance today and thank you officers for coming along for the information. It's been a really good meeting having a lot's been uh, put forward. Thank you very much indeed.